baby bats. I choose you. Are you for real? Say it! Hey! I'd like to purchase some of your finest beer, please. You literally did the opposite of what a superhero is supposed to do. Basically 15. Oh, did you see that? Yeah, you electrocuted a bus and almost killed these people. And then I caught it! Right, welcome everyone. This is episode 67 of the Comics in Motion podcast. I am Chris Phelps and my co-host and very good friend is Mr. Dave Horrocks. Hi Chris and hello to our listeners out there. Welcome to Comics in Motion. What we like to do here is we like to review movies and TV shows that are based on comic books. Myself, I'll be reviewing from the perspective of a long-time comic book reader. And I'll be reviewing from the TV and movie perspective. And what we also like to do is we also like to spoil the hell out of everything we review. So if you haven't watched our choice of the week, then we'd advise you to proceed with caution. And remember, with an average podcast comes no responsibility. What we also love is when you can head over to Apple Podcasts or your podcast catcher of choice and drop us a five-star review. This really helps us to grow the show and gets us out there to other listeners. Now, Chris, in terms of news this week, have anything caught your eye? Not a lot, Dave. I threw out a little tweet on social media and said, asked everybody who they thought would be going up to the Asgard Cemetery in the Sky at the end of Endgame. And I just put the four main protagonists of the Avengers, as I see it anyway. So we've got Steve Rogers, Captain America, Tony Stark, Iron Man, Thor, and Bruce Banner, the Hulk. And in fourth place is the Hulk. Third is Thor. And I didn't mean to do it in this order, Dave, but this is how I put the tweet out. Second is Tony Stark, and the one that everyone is saying will be killed off, and this could be down to Chris Evans' his, his social media, some of the things he said about not playing Cap again, is Steve Rogers, Captain America. So I just thought it was a nice thing to throw out there, Dave. Now, I've got to be honest, Dave, I think the top two are the most likely candidates, if I'm being completely honest, if any, bite the dust literally this time again. Yeah, I can't help but feel they're going to leave the door open, you know? I mean, it's comics, so uh, or comic book movies, so you can bring st- people back. You know, Loki's got his own series, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How many times has he died? Um, I can't help but feel, and I think this might be just a bit of sentiment talking, but I, I can't help but feel that Steve Rogers is somehow going to end up back in the past he's going to end up back in 1944 he's going to meet up with peggy he's going to finally have that dance with peggy and then maybe you know as we cut to today you know he's an old he's an old guy and maybe maybe pops his clogs that way yeah but i i i just feel like they might leave it open yeah yeah i I think for me personally dave i agree and i I, the only thing i would say is i'd hope that they don't erase every single film that's gone before it which potentially could happen. I just think it's a great timeline of films. I mean, they're never going to ruin the films because you can go back and watch them, but it might cheapen that watchability again if you know what, you know, just so I mean, like the end result is something yeah, yeah. off tangent, I will see. I mean, it, yeah, they did that in a positive way, didn't they, with X-Men Days of Future Past, where they managed to rewrite out Dark Phoenix or, or the X-Men 3. Yeah. But, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't like it if if they rewrote everything and basically invalidated everything. I I, I agree. I, I don't think they'll do that. No, I don't, to be honest. But we'll see. We'll see. Now, also, Dave, is there anything else you'd seen this week? Well, I must admit, it's getting we're in the month when Endgame is going to come out, and I am like a, a ninja on Twitter in terms of well, more like a scared cat actually. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I, I mean, I saw something this morning, which is, you know, end game spoilers leaked or something like that. I'm just like, right, no, nope, close it down. Not looking yeah. at that. Don't want to see anything. <laughs> so I'm trying to stay away from, you know, everything that looks spoilery or trailery um, or not trailery, but, you know, definitely spoilery. But I did see that Kevin Feige's hinted that end game might be Stanley's last cameo. Yeah, and so what he'd said was, you know, it's not it's not conclusive, but and I don't know whether he's he's playing up a bit here, but he said he can't really remember if Stan was a bit too ill to film uh, the last kind of cameo for the Spider Man for Far From Home. Yeah, so he, he basically said, you know, this this could be his last cameo. And must admit, 
made me a little bit sad. Yeah, it's sad to be honest. His, his voice is synonymous with popping up somewhere unexpected, isn't it, in these films? So, yeah, and he was nice in Captain Marvel, wasn't it, what they did at the start? And I think they're going to probably do the same intro again, Dave, and there might be a little bit more at the end of this because this is like the full stop on this whole universe, isn't it, really, for, at this point of time anyway? Yeah, what is it? They're, they're now calling this first, you know, we've had 21 movies, haven't we? So... What was it they're calling it the Infinity Saga or something like that? Oh, so right. this this first batch of films is all part of the Infinity Saga, apparently. So oh, the right. Endgame really is going to finish off, and then we're going to effectively start a, a new chapter. No, I mean I, I'm excited for that as well, Dave. I mean more than anything, I'd, I've got to agree with you completely. Literally, we're both posts on our Twitter account and the Instagram and stuff, and I'm literally posting. Twitter's the worst what I need to post, and then I'm not even checking the timeline, Dave. I mean, we're in a lot of groups with fellow comic book movie fans, aren't we? And we're all chatting there, and even then I'm staying away from them groups because yeah. someone inadvertently is going to say something, and not on purpose, or you're going to get some absolute muppet who's going to put stuff on and ruin the film, like I mentioned in a few episodes ago with the Han Solo and The Force Awakens and that, Dave. I just I can't abide by it. This, to me, I know this sounds daft. I don't, I, you probably feel the same, but for me... Irrespective of the podcast, even if we weren't doing the podcast, it's, it's, it feels like it's one of the most important films we're going to watch in a long, long time. And I, I don't say that lightly, Dave. It just feels like it's it's just too good to ruin. I'd just be so gutted if someone ruins the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I still always think back to that clip with Homer Simpson and he's walking out, you know, having just watched Empire Strikes Back and he's walking past the line, the queue of people who are queuing up to go in and he says something like, I can't believe Darth Vader's Luke Skywalker's father or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, when we, when we watched Infinity War last year, we said, didn't we, that it, that's raised the bar for everything. Yeah. You know, you, I, and I just think Endgame is, is going to be better, or at least I hope it is. Yeah, I think it will be, Dave, to be honest. I mean, it's going to take a lot to beat Infinity War, but I think it will. I think it will. We'll get a lot of answers finally, won't we? So, yeah, yeah. You know, very hope good. so. Exactly. Yeah. Now, Dave, going back to the Batman episode from last week, it was actually Batman's 80th birthday, wasn't it? And there was a lot of celebrations online. I saw some cakes being dished out. Kevin Conroy was there, obviously, voices Batman and the animated series from the 90s and some of the newer stuff. And we didn't mention it, so apologies, guys. And uh, also, I think you've got a bit of an apology this week, Dave, haven't you? I have. Uh, apologies a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, want, I want to call myself out. So I, I, I just... You know, so I do listen back to our episodes. Obviously, when we're going through editing, you you you're listening back anyway. Um, you know, and and if there's any glitches or anything, I'm taking those out. So you do kind of listen to it, but end to end, you know, I'll typically listen to the podcast just just as a listener as well, just while I'm in the gym or something, as well as you know other podcasts and what have you. And I was listening to myself talking, and I realised, you know, sometimes when you're speaking, you you've got something in your head, but your mouth is saying something else. And I, I'd referred a few times to, you know, things that Zack Snyder had said and, and, you know, his perspective and whatever. And I was listening back and I kept talking about Scott Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you know, Chris, but Scott Snyder is a, a writer yeah. and he's, he's, he's actually been right. He'd been writing Batman for a long time. He's currently writing justice league quite, you know, in the comic writing space, quite a big name, but obviously, you know, he's a completely different person to Zack Snyder. <laughs> and I guess somewhere in my head, I guess, cause we were talking about Batman it all got muddled up in my head. So yeah, apologies if you did pick up on that last week, but it's, it was definitely, you know, Zack Snyder's the, the film director, um, and Scott Snyder's the, the comic book writer there. <laughs> so I should, I should put myself on the wall of shame. <laughs> yeah, excuse me on that, Dave, for saying something like that, but no, very good. And also, I think you've got a bit of news for all Amazon Prime subscribers, haven't you, Dave? Yeah, so it was something I stumbled across, actually. 
So, uh, you know, I, I look at a lot of uh, Comixology. So Comixology is a, a digital website. You've also got Marvel Unlimited, but obviously they, they only deal with Marvel stuff. And, it you know, you'll pay a subscription and then you get access to a, to a load of comics. And what I stumbled across this last week is if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you actually get access to a bunch of comics for free by default. Now, I don't know about you, Chris, but I signed up a few years ago to Amazon Prime just because I wanted free delivery on stuff. Yeah, me too. And then, yeah, you just end up, oh, right, you get TV as well. And the fan, oh, right, you get music app as well. I mean, it's it's not, obviously, if you've got Spotify or something like that, it's probably better and more songs. But, you know, something for free that you don't feel like you're paying for is great. And like I say, I just stumbled across it. And, yeah, you can just download it, you know, set it up on your Kindle app and uh, read a bunch of comics. And so I haven't looked at all the things that you can get access to, but some of the highlights I found, you, well, you can get the Grant Morrison run on Doom Patrol, which is uh, the best run of Doom Patrol quite honestly and we're going to be going to be looking at that next week you can get flashpoint which is a great flash story and also you know referring back to old mr scott schneider there you can get batman court of owls which is uh you know another really great run of batman there plus i am the uh carol danvers captain marvel that came out you can get those first few comics as well uh collected and this again if i'm i'm amazed by it you can get all this stuff free you know so uh well, not free, but if you're an Amazon yeah. Prime subscriber, you've got access to it. So I, I thought I'd just mention that because uh, there might be people out there like me. I just didn't know you could access this stuff. Dave, I didn't, to be fair. We, we you know, we say break of the fourth wall, but reading the program notes for today, I'd genuinely not even seen that. And I've been a Prime customer now for about, on and off for about three years. But these last eight, nine months, I've just gone solid with it because I absolutely... I just like Amazon over anything now, eBay, anything. I just think it's more reliable. It can come to your door on a Sunday. You can get it same day if you're that desperate. And the perks and even the gaming side of it, there's a lot of stuff with Twitch they've hooked up with because it's all related to the same company. Well, if the streaming sites, you're getting like skins and games free and everything just for paying that seven ninety nine. So it's a no-brainer for me if you've got that. And you get that. I watch a lot of the TV stuff, but stuff we review, some of it is on Amazon Prime. I'm a big fan of um, the Grand Tour. You know, the Top Gear spin off, yeah. like, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I watch stuff like that on there. So, and but me and Sam are big reality TV fans. So, I had an argument at work about that today, Dave. But you do get everything, the Kardashians <laughs> and everything on there as well. So, but that's a totally different argument. But yeah, but yeah, so it is value for money, but comic book wise, fantastic. And I think now you've done this, Dave, I, with me going away uh, in a few months or whatever, I'm going to download a lot of these and see if I can sit there properly and read them properly because I have enjoyed the comics we've read on the life of the podcast i just don't read them regularly enough to be honest so it'd be nice to see if i can get into some of the stuff we've reviewed yeah like i say i think i mean i've mentioned some of the highlights there i will go and, and you know have a look more it, it's not that i haven't found it that easy to browse through you know because you basically i can only seem to access it by going to google typing in amazon prime reader and then you know the little search box you know, is prefixed with uh, Prime Reader, and then you do you type like DC or Marvel or Image or something like that, or a title if you're looking for a specific title, and then it'll it'll come up. So I haven't found it that easy to browse through yet, but um, yeah, I'll I'll see if I can find some others that are, are nice, easy reads for you to take on holiday there. No, that'd be great. That really good day. Definitely pleased because I'll definitely and I'd love to feed back on the podcast when I come back as well. What I thought and if I've enjoyed any in that. So. Yeah, get me on that one, Dave. You'll have to DM me after this, definitely. Yep. Uh, so, Dave, we are now at the stage. Uh, what are we going to review this week, please? And have you got some comic background? Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to review Shazam. And we've both been looking forward to this a lot, haven't we? You know, expecting it to be a lot of fun. But before we get into the movie background and the, the movie itself, let's go through the comic background. Now, Pull up a chair, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mine was long last this, week, Dave, so go for it. Go for this it. This might go on for a little bit. But before I actually start, what I will say is uh, DC was previously called National Comics. So they changed their name in 1977 to DC Comics. But for the purposes of going through this, I, I'm just going to constantly refer back to them as DC. Now, Captain Marvel first appeared in Wiz Comics number 2 in December 1939. So if you remember, 
Superman, you know, Action Comics number one, Superman's debut was in 1938. So it's just a year after you got this Captain Marvel character coming up. Now, the publisher was a company called Fawcett Comics. And through the 1940s, he was the premier superhero. And he was even outselling Superman. But in 1953, Fawcett stopped publishing their flagship characters. They were facing a copyright infringement lawsuit from DC. The claim being that the character was just a straight copy of Superman. You know, it's far too similar. Now, in 1972, DC bought the rights for Captain Marvel from Fawcett. However, what happened in between 1953 and 1972 is where it gets really interesting. So in 1966, there was a company called MF Enterprises that took advantage of a copyright lapse and published four comics titled Captain Marvel. Now, this Captain Marvel character was an alien android that could detach his arms, hands, legs, and head when he shouted split. And then he could reattach himself when he shouted Zam. <laughs> <laughs> so split Zam, Shazam, completely different, Your Honor. <laughs> now, having no arms and legs could be where, you know, Monty Python got the idea for the Black Knight from. But, uh, yeah. So anyway, over at Marvel, you've got Stan Lee and co there. We're quite liking this idea of using a bit of a copyright loophole and convinced MF Enterprises to cease that Captain Marvel title, and they paid them $4,500 as a settlement. Now, Marvel's version of Captain Marvel was published late in 1967, so this period of 1966, 1967, really key in what dictates what's going to happen with the Shazam character in the future. So... Fast forward again, back to 1972. So DC have bought the original Captain Marvel, and they found they couldn't call their book Captain Marvel because Marvel, the company Marvel, now held the copyright to that. So DC ended up having to market the character as Shazam, though they'd say the original Captain Marvel as kind of a subtitle there. Now, this led to a lot of people just assuming that he was called Shazam, the character was called Shazam. And so it was as recent as 2011, DC basically renamed that character Shazam as part of their whole New 52 relaunch. And so hopefully you stayed with me there. But really, a really interesting story about, you know, well, why have you got these multiple Captain Marvels running around? He's now Shazam. He was previously Captain Marvel. What's, and, and there's nothing really, or there's not too much that's creative about it. It's all tangled up in copyright law and opportunism. So, yeah, that's pretty much it, Chris. <laughs> Good stuff, Dave. It's a lot, that, isn't it? A lot. And I know we mentioned it when we did our Captain Marvel review, didn't we? And we touched on that and said we were going to talk about it, but there's a lot of litigation there, Dave. A lot yeah. of stuff. <laughs> I, I, I like the, um, I mean, I haven't seen if you can get hold. I'm, I'm sure there must be copies out there of that MF Enterprises Captain Marvel, you know, and, and the whole, you know, split Zam thing. <laughs> I just think I would love to see those copies. Yeah. And uh, I have seen some panels from it, and it, it is quite comical. You know, they have the, you basically have this, you know, this body <laughs> with limbs and head flying off in all directions. But yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. Now, Chris, how about the movie background? Yeah, so I've got some this week, Dave. You, I don't know if you're going to need a chair, but it's a little bit, there is a little bit of stuff this week, actually. Um, it, originally, New Line Cinema took the rights to Shazam, and they were looking around the early 2000s to go with it. And there was multiple screenplay drafts by William Goldman uh, with the team of Alec Sokolow and Joe Cohen, Brian Goloboff and John August as well. So there was quite a team there of different writers for this. Now, they've written the scripts around the 2000s, but it looked, didn't actually go into pre-production until 2008. Now, they were looking at sort of an action comedy-based film. Now, this is quite interesting, especially with what we've just reviewed. And at that point, it was still known by Captain Marvel, obviously crossing over with what you said in the comic section, Dave. And it was all about the, you know, his young alter ego, Billy Batson. Now, Peter Seagull was on as the director, and he actually enrolled Dwayne The Rock Johnson to play as the villain, Black Adam. Now, I've seen this myself as a rock fan, follow his social media. He's constantly putting sort of fan-made pictures up, fictional stuff about being Black Adam. He's been canvassing for this part for a long time. But what happened was, due to the success of The Dark Knight in 2008 with Warner Brothers, 
And then the absolute failure of a recently reviewed film by us, Speed Racer, that tremendous film, Dave, which obviously I ruined Tony Farina's memories, <laughs> our good friend <laughs> who, who suggested it. They decided they weren't sure what to do, so it went into a bit of a limbo because the studio were pushing for a more dark and serious tone, but they actually felt, Goldman and that felt, that it had to be more comedy-based, Dave, and they weren't sure what was going to go on. So... In August 2010, the studio decided to cancel an actual theatrical movie. We're going to go with a live action TV series for sort of prime time. And that never went anywhere. And then in December 2013, again, they were staying a film wouldn't happen. And they were worried about the similarities between Captain Marvel, as he was called then, and Superman. And that became a massive obstacle, especially with the success of Man of Steel. Dave, don't say any more than Man of Steel. I like it. You don't. So anyway. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> saying say nothing. Saying nothing. I felt more maybe because of the financial side of it. So again, DC then decided, as we you've just mentioned, they decided to reboot the franchise. We had the whole thing with Captain Marvel. It was then changed to Shazam. So this brought about the idea of going with a Shazam film. And around July 2016, tentatively, again, they were going to make a film. And they actually confirmed that the, Dwayne The Rock Johnson will be starring in Shazam. But it's also undecided whether he was going to play Shazam or Black Adam. But with Johnson preferring to play the Black Adam character, Limbo again. And then in February 2017, David F. Sandberg was in talks to direct Shazam, which he was. But The Rock pulled out of it, Dave, and decided he wanted to pursue a solo film just concentrate on Black Adam as well, which I've not heard anything about that, to be fair, in the last couple of years, other than the odd little thing you might retweet or mention on Instagram. But he's that busy. It would be a few years yet before we see the rock thing. I've seen his schedule. It's got like eight films in the next two years, Dave. He can, he can grind them out like no other, the rock. So then by July 2017, once the rock had pulled out, they decided they were in full development for a Shazam film. Sandberg was definitely confirmed as the director. Again, Everything come out. They decided that they were going to go down the route of making the film like a cross between big and with, well, basically big with superpowers. Zachary Levi was on as Shazam, uh, the older version, obviously, Billy Batson. And he was in conjunction with DC Films and New Line. So this is where it all comes together. Now, Henry Cavill, who plays Superman, as we all know, was actually asked to reprise his role in this one, but his schedules just didn't permit Superman being on. And I did read online quite a few times that he was actually in talks to come into this. And they actually said at one point, this could be his last time where he plays Superman, Dave. So, With his tash or not his tash? <laughs> <laughs> I like to get more of it as a lip slug, actually, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully with none of the CGI, as we saw. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely terrible, that. But also, principal photography started taking place around about March, April 2018, and by November, December, the last sort of pre-production stuff was finished in Toronto. Now, the film's quite good, actually, Dave. It's got a, a pre-production budget of 80 to 90 million, which, considering what we said about Shazam, uh, not Shazam, what we said about Speed Race had been 120 million, and that was over 11 years ago, it's quite amazing. And they're saying that with the post-production uh, marketing, that it'll go hit more towards 100 million. Now, Dave, I think that's an unbelievable budget in this day and age. I know 80 to 90 million to me and you is something we'd live off the rest of our lives, for, but for a film, that's about average, really. Now, in April 2018, Shazam made its trailer debut at the Cinema Con Convention in Las Vegas with director uh, David S. Sandberg introducing like, all the behind-the-scenes footage. Zachary Levy's been prominent at a lot of the comic cons promoting this and on social media. He's very much Ryan Reynolds in his approach to so the, the character not taking himself too seriously, and I think that comes across. He seems like a very, very genuine guy. And obviously, I mentioned last week that Paul from DC Worlds met him He's done the interviews. He's actually said that he's a really nice guy. So that's really good. Yeah, so Shazam's actually already premiered in Toronto on March the 15th. And as we know, worldwide, it's just been released on April the 5th. Now, going off the test stuff, Dave, that they've already they said, they reckon it's going to hit 40 to 60 million in the US alone this weekend. As I mentioned this when we did the Aquaman review, and this is something with it being another DC property as Aquaman, quite interesting. Aquaman had flash releases over certain cinemas and certain deals within Amazon that they paid cinemas to, to promote it promote with, in conjunction with Amazon, special premiere events and stuff. Now, it was actually in conjunction with Fandango advanced screenings. Aquaman made $2.9 million when it was released a couple of weeks before worldwide. And this has already made 3.3 million, Dave. So it's looking prominent and looking really good for the film. And obviously, 
Aquaman's gone to over one billion already in sales, which is fantastic. We said it when we reviewed it; it was on a juggernaut. The opening sort of ten days of the film coming out was fantastic. So they're actually saying they think Shazam's going to overtake that, and with the big shadow looming of Marvel's Avengers Endgame, as we mentioned at the top of the show, it's going to be really interesting to see which makes more. I think Endgame will, but I think DC all of a sudden have started picking up some good momentum, especially in the sales side of it. Review-wise on Rotten Tomatoes, it's at 93%, Dave. It's one of the freshest films of the year. And that's of 91 reviews with an average rating, which I can't really say the average rating. It's 7.63, but considering it's not only just come out, I find that quite unusual but we'll see how that goes over its time on metacritic on the reviews of 22 critics at the moment it's at 75 percent out of 100 but that probably will increase when it comes out to the worldwide audience and that's about it day for the movie stuff very good very good should we get into our review let's go Hello there, Physically Attractive Podcast listener. My name is Steve Ross. I'm Sean Crandall. I'm Dustin White. And we're the hosts of... Dregs of Craigs. On our podcast, we explore the most bizarre, repulsive, and downright confounding Craigslist ads we can find from all over the country, live for your amusement. Come find out the best place to book an axe-throwing party for your child's birthday. Stay up to date on Mario's Hawaiian Sex Marathon. Or just sit back and relax as we make more anime references than any rational human being should be comfortable with. It's a hilarious exploration of how we as a species are drifting further and further from the possibility of redemption. And we want you along for the ride. Listen to Dregs of Craig's on Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. So just a reminder again, we are going to spoil everything. So if you haven't watched this, I would probably hit that pause button, go and watch it, and then come back and we can do the walkthrough together. The wizard Shazam is in search of a pure of heart champion as he grows weaker and is less able to keep the seven deadly sins imprisoned. Back in 1974, the wizard summons a young Thaddeus Savannah, though he is deemed unworthy when tempted by the sins and causes a car crash when he's transported back. In the present day, Savannah cracks the code to get back to the wizard and sets the sins free to become their champion. The dying wizard is left to call on the orphan Billy Batson to make him his champion and transforms into an adult superhero when he says Shazam. Now, Chris, what did you make to this opening movie? Opening movie? Opening act? Yeah, I've got to say, Dave, I actually thought the first 15, 20 minutes were quite slow. Until Zachary Levy come onto the screen, I was I was a bit in the air thinking, you know, I, I, I'd seen the non-spoiler reviews. I'd seen, obviously, Paul from DC World and many of our others. You know, we have a Hulk podcast, uh, fellow podcasters who we follow, and, and they've been saying, you know, without spoiling how good it was and that. And I, I genuinely was like... It seems really like it's just, it was really thin, really, for me, it felt really thin anyway. And, and obviously, I've never seen any of the Shazam stuff properly or anything. So I had nothing to go off and got into it completely blind. But I don't know. I, don't, I, I genuinely was sat there about 15 minutes thinking, this is pretty poor, pretty thin to get him to turn into Shazam. The stuff with uh, Savannah was quite good. And what I actually liked was his father was Lyra Luther out of Smallville as well, which was really yeah. good. Um, and obviously he has a, a really bad relationship with his dad and his brother and, and they have the accident and stuff. And there's a couple of near misses and then they get taken out and all this. And, and it's a great start to it. And it shows uh, Savannah, uh, obviously, even as a young kid, he's tempted in here and he only wants his acceptance from his dad and his brother, but they treat him like dirt in this little opening segment in the car mm. and then we obviously we meet shazam i'm trying not to say it there in case i change but uh, yeah <laughs> um <laughs> but, but yeah i, I don't know I, I, what what did you think because obviously the first 10 15 minutes is literally the backstory of savannah it starts with him in 1974 and then obviously we go forward then don't we to sort of billy as a kid being sort of push from he's robbing a police car isn't he? and I, I genuinely i don't know i just I, until he come on the and even the young billy batson's really good but until they come on the screen i was not really invested in what was going on okay i i'm a little bit surprised that you've said that to be honest because i thought i've had criticism for films in the past of just being slow and then not really being much that that's going on and and gets you sucked into the action whereas i thought the whole stuff with savannah the way it started there, I, I was not expecting. 
but I thought that was that was quite interesting. You know, straight away you get to see the wizard, and you know you get to see the sins. You get a little bit of explanation about what what his motivations are, and then you get the car crash. I, this is all in the first few minutes, and I I thought that bit. I thought, oh great, you you actually get a little bit of action, you know, and a bit of backstory straight off the bat there. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That, I mean, I, I know going back on the old episodes, I've even said that. And I'm like, it takes too long. Our first ever episode, Superman, it takes 50 minutes before we actually see anything, don't we? And we, and we, I was heavily criticising that, you know, that film. So I don't mean to sound like I'm contradicting, but but genuinely, I don't know what I expected going into it, but it wasn't the start. And I know there's got to be a backstory. You can't just come in there and Billy turns into Shazam. But I don't know. I just wasn't invested in it, Dave. I, I, I can't explain how I felt, and I genuinely, it, it was just a very strange opening, for me personally anyway. And then, obviously, once Billy's on and Zachary Lever, absolutely brilliant. I mean, he he's amazing in this film. I've got to give him full credit. He's, he's, his comedy timing and one-liners are brilliant. And the young lad who's his brother with the stick as well, he's really, really funny. Yeah, you know, Freddie. Really, Freddie, yeah, they're a great double act together. But, but yeah, and there's a lot goes on at the start. Freddie's getting bullied. He gets knocked over by these kids in the car, doesn't he, at the school? And, and you know, they absolutely pick him up like, you know, you're going to fix this kid sort of thing. You've dented our car when they've absolutely nearly killed him. And Billy gives him a good cracking with the stick and then ends up getting chased off, doesn't he, down the subway. And this is where he becomes and meets the wizard, doesn't he? Uh, and, and that was great, Dave. I genuinely, from that point on, I really, really, I did enjoy the film, genuinely. And, and this first act, I thought... After that initial bit for me, it set it up nicely for Billy because, like I say, Billy, the young Billy and the older, obviously, Shazam, brilliant, brilliant one-liners and some really breaking the fourth wall stuff. I wonder if, you know, in terms of not being invested and not really caring about it, making that first 15 minutes or so feel quite long, I I wonder if you're just chomping at the bit because you've seen many, many trailers, as we all have, of Shazam. And so you, you're possibly chomping at the bit there to, to just get Zachary Levi on the screen and not really caring about the backstory. So I think if I, if I think of it like that, then I can kind of see where you're coming from, I think. Yeah, and, and like I, I'm, we've got Avengers in a few weeks. It's going to be three hours long, Dave. I'm pretty sure there's nothing in that's going to make me think, oh, that's gone on too long. I'm pretty... <laughs> And that's bad, isn't it? It's a total contradiction. But I, you know yourself, you've got into stuff and the stuff we reviewed, the stuff I absolutely love and the stuff that you hate or somewhere where you think, oh, it's all right. And I've, you know, we've done the same thing with both of us. It's weird, isn't it, how your tastes are, are totally different. And I wasn't going into this negative. I was going to it really positive. You know, I've, I've arranged so many things this weekend to go watch it yesterday. And, and we were genuinely all in and, and Sam came with me and everything. And I, I don't know, I, I, just weird at the start for me. I, I, can't, I won't keep harping on about it, but it just seemed not my cup of tea at the start. Uh, interesting. I mean, I, I, I was enjoying it right right from the start. Um, like I say, maybe there was a, a little too much of Billy before you get to the Shazam stuff, but this is an origin movie. And I think, again, if you, if you look at it, you just have to compare it with other origin movies. You know, if you can compare it to like the Captain Marvel that we saw a few months ago, I know it was last month, wasn't it? Yeah. Longer than that now, (laughs) (laughs) you know, the Captain America, the Iron Man, you know, that I think that's what you're comparing it to. Um, As opposed to, I I think Avengers, it's going to be, all in straight from the start because you're joining it in its 22nd movie you know yeah. so it's a, it's a little bit different there but i think what i would say is you know they they had a, a nice misdirection um again i didn't really think i wasn't expecting them to start off with savannah so i was i was expecting them to start off with the hero so i thought that was good and then you know when uh you've got the wizard talking about you know someone pure of heart i, th- I think a lot of people if not everyone knows that billy batson is you know he's going to turn into shazam and so you know that very first scene with him where he's like golly you know and he looks all like uh, nicey nicey 
you know, he's called the police and he's been a stand-up citizen. And then actually he's locking the coppers in there and you find out, well, as he's walking that line of the of the law. And, you know, he, he doesn't seem like the whiter than white, pure of heart hero that we expect. And actually that, that reflects a lot of the way when Shazam was finally renamed Shazam from being Captain Marvel and brought into main DC continuity. That's how they, they kind of wrote him back in 2011. He, he's not really that nice a guy. Yeah. You know, um, and, and so you don't really know why is he at 7 billion people on the planet? Why is he the one that's pure of heart? Because he doesn't really seem to be pure of heart. No, no, he's just a little rogue. And obviously the, the reason he's, he's nixed the police, well, he doesn't nixed the information off the police is the fact that he's after his mother, isn't he? He's, he? They have a flashback of his mother abandoning him at the fair, don't they? Like the, yeah. And, and you know, we, we don't understand why till later on. But, but so in, in that respect, you're right. There's, there's a flip side to him, isn't there? There's a little mischievous one and he's been in and out of foster homes. And I, I've got to say, Dave, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm just like a right thingy now, but, I wasn't totally convinced by the foster parents. I, I thought it was a bit of a weird casting, if I'm being honest. They didn't look or feel like a couple. I, I don't know why. I don't know whether you got that at all. But for me, it, it, it was just somewhat slightly off for me. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just I didn't buy it in. Buy into it completely. To be honest, I'm, I'm almost to the end of my. I've, I started with Walking Dead again, going way back to uh, season one, episode one. So yeah. I've been doing that for the last few months, um, and I've just got up to the the kingdom where um, this guy, the the father, is in there as well. He's part of the part of the kingdom. So <laughs> as soon as he came on, I'm like, ah, oh, he's from Walking Dead. <laughs> so um, I, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about them as a couple. Again, yeah, they, I guess, do look a little bit like an odd couple, but I guess that there's a running theme there, isn't it? I mean, it's so you do have this multicultural family, don't you? You do have, you know, you don't have this nuclear family that, you know, this, this kind of perfect Midwestern family or anything. It's, it's all people from different backgrounds. And I guess, you know, for that, I, I was quite invested. I, I quite liked, you know, to be honest, when, when you speak about foster homes and stuff, I, I think more like Biker Grove and, yeah. you know, Grange Hill and stuff like that. It's all fairly depressing and bad. And, you know, these seem to be doing a pretty good job of, uh, you know, they were, the parents were from foster, uh, backgrounds as well. And they seem to be doing a good job of, of, you know, it wasn't a perfect family, wasn't it? Was it? But no, no I, I felt quite heartened by it. I, I thought it was a good environment. Obviously, Billy doesn't take to it. You know, he doesn't he doesn't like it. He's used to bouncing around from place to place. He's 14. And, and as a lot of four, young 14 year old lads know, I'm sure you were the same. You know, we think we know it all, don't we, at that age? And, you know, you're at that in-betweeners stage, you know, and you don't need parents really. So I, I, I have to say I, I was bought in and I was really enjoying this movie, I think, straight from the off. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you on the family. I think the kids are that brilliant. Uh, the young the young girl who's like hugging him all the time, saying to him, you know, what, be your sister and all this. She's, like, she's a little sweetie, isn't she? Yeah, she's really good, <laughs> really good. And I, and I think as well, like, the whole interaction between Billy and Freddie, which we'd partially seen in the trailer when he says, like, you know, things get a bit Game of Thrones at night. But there's actually a bit more <laughs> dialogue to that as well. But he is really funny, Freddie. He's so your average Joe, and he's obviously got some sort of uh, debilitating illness because he has a stick. But everywhere in his room, he's full of Superman and Batman stuff, isn't there? He shows mm -hmm. him a Superman bullet that's authenticated. He's got a, a non-replica. He's not an original, but he's got a replica, sorry, Batarang, and he? And he's wearing Superman, backpack, Superman shirt. So there's all that, which which is exactly what you said in the last episode, Dave, the, the crossover stuff regarding it's not subtle enough. Uh, it's too, it doesn't have to be subtle, you know, to to mean something. So I, I it, genuinely it can be subtle. Do you mean? Yes. Sorry, it can be <laughs> subtle, and I think I think in this they hit the tone really well because you know it's within that world. As much as I was have been critical of stuff like that in the past, I think with this they hit it really, really well. It was just there all the time. They didn't hide from you know. Like, I said, didn't I've said before about the Marvel stuff we like. We mentioned it loads of times. The Punisher, the Daredevil, and 
it, it's a case of that never addresses or mentions anything, but how can it be set within that world? We've talked about this recently, haven't we? So, so it's like, why would you say that and not mention it? And they don't win this. It's just there. And I think, to mm -hmm. me, I like that completely. Don't lie about it. Don't pretend that there's something else not going on. Just show people. They're not daft. And I think it was a really, really good subtle touches all the way through the film. Yeah, and he plays a really good role, Freddie, doesn't he? Because he's yeah. obviously obsessed with superheroes. Again, you're in that world, so you know he's obsessed with the real life superheroes. Got a lot of knowledge to it. Probably is a comic book geek as well. You know, so so he's the one when we get into it, guiding Billy in terms of how he, you know, how he tests out his powers and stuff like that. But um, I mean, I do like kind of when. He turns into Shazam, you know, he, he wakes up on the tube, doesn't he? And, you know, he just looks ridiculous <laughs> 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 because everyone else is sort of fully dressed and he just kind of wakes up with this guy who stood over him, doesn't he? You know, giving yeah. him a bit of abuse. Yeah. So, got... um, go on, sorry. <laughs> so I've got to say, though, them, we've not seen shoulder pads since Sue Ellen, that Shazam suit. They are the most ridiculous shoulder pads I've ever seen. I mean, his body, he's in great shape. You've seen the pictures, but he never looked like that out of the suit. Did he? Henry Cavill pulls off that that look, but am I, and I know it's done on tongue and cheek because he's a big guy and he must be about 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, he's, he's a tall bloke, isn't he, Zachary Levy? But Dave, he's fantastic in this film. He really is fantastic. I think it, it's just so funny, uh, unintentionally as well, but, but the way he plays a 14-year-old kid as an adult I actually think he plays it even better than what Tom Hanks did in Big, and that's a big statement. Yeah, I, th I think it's up there, but the only... So I'm going to nitpick now. The only thing that jarred with me a little bit, I think, is he plays it so well, this younger, naive kid. The kid plays older than him. Oh. So when he goes to Billy, when, when it's the young actor, Billy Batson, he's kind of standoffish and he's trying to play it all cool. Whereas when it's Zachary Levi, he's like all hyper and, you know, dude, did you see that? And then I caught it, you know, later on. So uh, that stood out to me and it was like, he's not playing this. The, there's a lack of continuity there. You know what, Dave? That is an absolute fantastic spot. I've got to say, I know we go on about this and I'm not absolutely sucking up here Dave. i've got to say that is a brilliant analysis because I, now, as you've said it now you were completely right absolutely on the money it should have been the other way around more than anything shouldn't it so yeah great spot dave I, i'm not even going to question that i think you've just blown my mind a little bit there because i didn't even think of that yeah i mean it, it, it like i say i i've Thoroughly enjoyed this all the way through, especially, you know, this first act I was bought in. Obviously, I know what the background is. You know, it's very golden age. You know, it was back in the, you know, when you had Superman coming out in Action Comics number one. And then, you know, a year later, you had uh, Captain Marvel, as he was known then, coming out. So it's all a little bit like that. And there's a, there's a very obscure spin-off kind of character who's, who's called Miracle Man. Uh, also known as Marvel Man that Alan Moore wrote and and he kind of wrote a story that was poking fun a little bit at that and it turns out they were actually brainwashed you know to thinking that uh, they were <laughs> taken in by this wizard but yeah so so I wasn't deliberately looking for things but it did as soon as he changed into that uh, into Zachary Levi I, I, I was just like hang about that that's not the same as as he was just now no. <laughs> Honestly, fantastic spot. You know, and like you said at the top of the show, the show and we've mentioned it before went to we we do spoil everything, guys. So if you are listening to it before you watch it, watch it with your own opinion on this. But as someone it's actually it's just such a, such a good good quote, Dave. Really good. It is and it's it's strange that I didn't even see it until you just said it. Yeah, well hopefully I haven't just spoiled it for all our listeners as well who've watched it and enjoyed it um again it is it is a nitpick it didn't really alter my enjoyment of it i just it was just one of those things that's like oh that's that's a little bit weird no good one dave good one very good one the I say first part of the film was a bit jekyll and hyde enjoyed it once they were where they were teaming up and he was flicking in between shazam and with freddie and stuff brilliant with the help of his foster brother, Freddy, Billy tests out his new powers and he becomes an internet sensation by posting the 
tryout videos online. But Billy lets Freddy down at school and the pair are shown arguing on TV together. Savannah learns of his existence from the Seven Deadly Sins and attacks Shazam, wanting his power, and he easily defeats him. Shazam turns back into Billy Badson and blends into the crowd to escape the supervillain. But Savannah sees Freddy and recognizes him from the news and kidnaps him and blackmails Shazam with the safety of his foster family and asks him to surrender his power. So, act number two, Chris. You said you're a bit more into it when Zachary Levi comes onto it. So let's focus on this montage. Oh, it wasn't really a montage, was it? But this testing out of the powers. But what do you make to this whole bit where they're experimenting? You've got that. It's really hard to talk about Shazam, isn't it? Without mentioning that, that term, wish fulfillment. But yeah. I just thought, you know, the first part of act number two, you know, it's just, it's just joyous. I, I can't think of a better word than that no it, it, you're right you're totally right i agree i think one of the bit, best bit obviously he's testing his powers out is we'd seen in the trailer where he goes into a 7-eleven as they call it in america to, to get some beer doesn't he? and he walks in and, he's, and it was so reminding the in between is when will goes in he, he's got the full <laughs> trench coat on and he goes hello i would like to buy some beer you know and, I, and, I am a man <laughs> Yeah, I am a fan. I would like, and, she's, and he goes in with the full suit on, and he says, "I would like to buy some beer." And she just looks at him and points at whatever it is. But, but we'd seen that the shop gets robbed, and obviously Freddy stood behind him, and he like hides only like a little kid, doesn't he? When the, these two blokes come in with balaclavas on, but we'd only seen in the trailer that someone had shot him once, and then he throws him out the window. But with there's more to it, and this bit's brilliant because he gives them the gun back. They shoot him in the stomach, <laughs> and, and Freddy goes, shoot him in the face. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, I'm, and, and I'm thinking, and oh, they're not going to shoot. And they shoot him in the face, and it's just like a little, like he's flicking his face into it, and he stands there for ages. And, he, and Billy's, uh, Freddy's filming it, and he's like authenticating, and all the bullets are on the floor. And the next minute he goes, you're dead, and throws him out the window, doesn't he? And we get the, the same news. <laughs> but I thought that bit was fantastic it was so funny like because that genuinely had everyone in the cinema in stitches dave and there's not been many films i've watched recently where everyone was laughing there was a lot of younger kids in there with adults parents and stuff but, mm -hmm. but genuinely it was there was some really funny bits in this really and it's this whole middle section for me was my favorite part of the film yeah, it, it was great, wasn't it? And like you say, there was lots of laughs in the cinema for us as well. And, you know, being in the UK, I've watched things in the, in the US as well, and people are a lot more, they, they let go of their emotions easier. You know, in the UK, yeah. a, a cinema watching audience is typically a bit more reserved, aren't they? But, you know, lots of laughs for this one. And I, I just thought it was brilliant. Like you say, when they when they shoot him, said, oh, well, it's, it could still be the suit. Shoot him in the face. And he's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did think, you know, I was thinking for Freddy, I, I would back away a little bit. <laughs> you know? yeah. You're not bulletproof. Yeah. I kept thinking that, Dave. I was thinking, thinking, thinking them bullets are going to ricochet. He was literally on his yeah. shoulder, wasn't he? Exactly yeah, like yeah. you. Exactly like you, Dave. So I, I know it's so stupid, but I think the parent in me comes across, and you probably did the same thing, you know, he, he's, he's definitely going to get a take a bullet here, Freddy. You know, cause yeah, they, they, yeah. Were, they were perfect shots as well, weren't they? But... Forget about that. It was all done for laughs. You are right. It was fun. The only thing I've got in the middle, which really bugs me, is him and Freddy have a falling out. Freddy says, done it to all the kids, like Shazam's my friend. He's going to come and have dinner. And because these two lads who've been bullying him, they say, like, if he's not here, we're going to, you know, we're going to get you sort of thing, beat you up. And he goes off Billy, doesn't he? He's actually Billy. He's not Shazam. And he goes off. He's like, you know, I think you're enjoying it more, being a hero more than me. And, he says that, but then the next minute he stood on the rocky steps, which they'd been to earlier on, and he's doing the whole <laughs> to, to eye of the tiger. Doom, 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 doom. And, Honestly, uh, Chris, sorry to cut across you sorry. there, but all the way home, I was just, I had humming, humming away. I was just going, lightning, lightning from my hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lightning from my hands. <laughs> lightning yeah. from my hands. <laughs> <laughs> It was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, that bit, all, all that is brilliant. The only thing I've got that really bugged me was he's obviously got all the powers now pretty much any on point. He's done all the testing. And I know the eye one didn't work because he put his finger on his eye, didn't he, as if he was firing laser eyes. Yeah. That was quite funny. But he fires off to a, a bus. So the bus catches, he blows the tyre up and the bus is hanging over the side. Very reminiscent of Superman 1 on the bridge in it, the swing. Yeah, yeah. Like, the kids. 
And what I can't understand is he, he rushes over, looks up at him, and I'm thinking, why doesn't he just fly up and lift him up? I can't understand what was going on. He, he, he seems to just forget about everything, all his powers and that. And obviously these people, he's very much reminding me of Jurassic Park 3 when they're hanging over the bridge, over the cliff, and everyone's in that sort of um, truck. And they're all on the glasses. It's cracking and stuff. And what I didn't get was he doesn't do anything. He, he waits and waits and waits until the last second. And then it falls and he catches it. And I'm thinking, there's no continuity there because he, he, he was doing all sorts of things before then, which was a bit well, he, weird. He couldn't fly, though, could he? he? He was sort of making a bit of progress with flying, but he couldn't really fly at that point. No, but he could leap, couldn't he? He'd le leapt a few times. And I'm thinking, that's not... And with the strength, I'm thinking, surely... And I know I'm thinking out of the box here, Dave. I'm not trying to be too overcritical, but but straight from that. Well, what, be, before we move on, though, I will say because because not so much. I, I mean, I was wondering the same. You know, why don't he just fly up? And I thought, oh no, he's he, he can't really fly at that point. He could have just jumped and then pushed the bus back on the bridge, I guess. Yeah, but I I did think you know you had people falling down, and it's still the bridge is is a way way up, isn't it? But he catches it with the glass. <laughs> and holds the glass as he's And cracked. holds the glass, you know, which yeah. is cracked because someone had fallen down against it. And I just thought, well, even even though he's caught it, you're still dropping those people in the bus, you know, without seatbelts or anything, is dropping down that distance and then suddenly stops because he's yeah. caught it. Catching it or letting it hit the ground, there's about six foot difference. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it. So, yeah. so you know that didn't really work that well for me. But I did like again just the bit of fun. You've got a dog just watching it there. Yeah, <laughs> and, he, and he wants to put the bus down, and he's like, yeah. "Come on, just yeah. just move out of the way." You know, again, I yeah. thought that was a, a bit of fun. And I guess what I wish, and I, it's a tough balance to act sometimes, isn't it? Because they've drummed up a lot of excitement for this movie in the trailers. Yeah. You know. Uh, but they've they've given away some of the best moments there. Yes, yes. I, I, it was something that you said about obviously X Men, you know, Dark Phoenix. They pretty much give the whole plot away in the trailer. I, I, I didn't think I think they did a good job with Shazam in the trailers. But when you watch the film, there was quite a few. of The best bits were revealed, weren't they? Yeah. You sort of hoping that the, the trailers around the sort of start of it and stuff, and there's a lot more to it. But the only bit with this is he puts the bus down. And obviously, everyone's there, saves the day, aren't they? Everyone comes out cheering and all that. And then Freddie comes and starts having a Barney with him. And what I found really strange was, this was the only time in the film where Shazam had sort of gone off on his own. And he was literally a 30-second montage of him doing this thing with, the, you know, light, lightning out my hands and all that. And then Freddie just gives him a top, proper dressing down, like, you've become dead selfish and blah, blah. And I'm thinking, he was only the seat, just because he didn't want to come and have dinner with you. I just didn't make sense that conversation. I was thinking he's not really done anything wrong, other than he was he was doing a bit of busking for his for some money. But it's not like he'd gone off the rails, Superman three job or like a Hancock type film, because it does feel a bit like Hancock when he's learning his powers at times. You know, with Will Smith, Dave, and 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 I know that was he was an alcoholic Hancock, but it felt like that sometimes, which was quite funny. But I don't know. I just I felt that was a bit of a weird conversation because I thought he's only let him down once, but he was really laying into about how selfish you've become and all this. I don't know if you felt the same. It just felt very rushed that bit. I guess if we go to one of your favourites, so Superman Two. Yeah, I was surprised when we went back and watched that about how quick it was when he lost his powers and then got beat up and got them back again. It was only like. 15 minutes or something like that yeah it, it was yeah. really short and yet in my memory i remember it being you know he, he hasn't got his powers for half of the movie or something and i guess just in that format you know we're, we're spoiled a bit aren't we because when we watch these like netflix series or you know these long series with where you've got all this time to explore these characters you you've got basically one and a half to two hours to tell this end-to-end -end story and so i i didn't think it was i didn't think it was that strange i mean he, he'd been cut in school hadn't he yeah. so you know because he thinks right well I, I don't need to do any more growing up now look at me i'm a i'm a fully grown adult you know i'm i'm mid 20s to 30 <laughs> <laughs> he was saying, you know, so so he's already, you know, letting it go to his head a little bit there. And I guess, you know, Freddie, 
in some respects, was being a little bit selfish, wasn't he? You know, he he just wants to be popular at school, and so he wants to use Shazam to make him popular. Yeah, I think what what I found more weird was given these uh, school bullies had basically chased Billy, you know, onto the tube station where he ends up meeting the wizard. Uh, they seem to forget that pretty quickly. Yeah, and then still, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they still seem to want to give Freddie a dressing down. And Billy's right there. And they're like, who are you? you yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, because he, he cracked him with the stick and with the, the actual crutch. And if it had been yeah. me and someone had hit me with that, you'd want to go after him, wouldn't you? Or if you'd hit someone like that, you'd take a wide berth, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh, forget that. I'm not. So, yeah, I did think that was strange because he's, he's in the corridor of the school, isn't it? He's just stood there. Yeah. I told, you're yeah, totally yeah. right. You're totally right. He, like I say, I, I hate it when I, I, in some respect, I don't hate it, but I, I like to, when I see something that bugs me, I like, this is the whole point of, of us reviewing it. And I don't want it to sound so negative because it's not, it's a re- it's a good film, but it was just a few things felt a bit off at times. And that didn't make sense. But this is where we get introduced to Savannah then, don't we? He comes down behind Shazam and Shazam's taking all the plaudits, don't we? And everyone sort of seems to think he's a superhero. And then he absolutely nails Shazam, doesn't he? He, he? Basically, Shazam turns into Billy then, within the even though he's in an adult body, and he, he's petrified of him, isn't he? Because he can't beat him. Mm-hmm. And and that's a good yeah. scene, Dave, through the the shopping mall and that and everything. That's really good. It was it, there was some bits though that because they proper played on it, especially the bit, and it was fantastic because obviously it's very similar to Big. He ends up on the piano, doesn't he? And you think yeah. he's going to play a bit of the piano, and then he doesn't. He gets frozen. He just nails him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was really funny. That was good, that. Really good. And there was a bit when it was a bit like the Terminator, because Shazam gets thrown on his back, and he's laying on his back. It's like Terminator 2, and Arnie first gets introduced in the arcade and stuff, the shopping mall, and gets thrown through the wall, and then he's on the floor for a second, then he gets up. And I think these little nods to different things throughout this day that are really, really good. And this is when he's throwing Batman at Savannah, and he? he goes in the toy shop. Yeah. And throws, like Teddy's getting at him. Batman. Yeah, get him Batman, and throws like a big, like four foot Batman at him and stuff. So yeah, again, great stuff. Again, great little one liners. Even when he's getting beat, there's a joke in him, which is very reminiscent of the Marvel stuff as well. He, he must have had such a laugh filming this i mean you know we get to see these edited scenes and and that you know how many takes and he just looks like he's having a ball doesn't he and it's not just in the movie but when you see him you know being interviewed and stuff he he just seems so grateful and you know has a lot of joy for it yeah because and and to be fair i'll be honest if anyone's going to take the children who's listened to this um you know you've you've not seen it listen to our review there is a few bits because literally within Five minutes, and then there's a lot of young kids in front of me. The S word gets said, the you know, SH1T. Then you've got like the gore when it obviously uh, seven sins go and attack Savannah's dad and brother, yeah, yeah. And, and that's violent, Dave. It was a bit reminiscent of Ghostbusters, I felt, so in the way some of the devils went in Ghostbusters and chased. Them. I know the CGI is a lot better, but there was a lot of little nods to different films. It, it feels very 80s the way this is made at times, which is a good thing as well. It's not a bad thing. It's so, This is just something, even so like a third of the way through the, two thirds of the way through the film, it's made in a, a totally different tonal way in anything DC have done. Complete, even Suicide Squad, which is, you know, it's got some funny bits in, but even then at the core of it, it's a very dark film. This This is just done completely for laughs it's a very much a, a sort of feel-good film isn't it really yeah but i mean going on on what you're saying about in the boardroom uh, i think that was I, I was a, a little bit shocked when he just threw his brother straight out of the window <laughs> and then you know so just everything's done for laughs i'm not quite sure that bit was no. um but then the yeah, when they're all kind of the, uh, the boardroom, they're all pressed up against the glass, you know, and the guy is just letting him get get on with it. Because when Mark Strong walks through, it's like you can't go in there, you can't go in there. But again, he's got slight amnesia, hasn't he? Once he's in, <laughs> he's not yeah. trying to get in there and get him out or anything. No. It's just like all right, okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, so so there are a few, you know, there are a few little swear words in there. It is a twelve. 12a over here isn't it so imagine it'd be pg-13 in the u.s and rightly so you know because a lot of it you know you would say could almost be a u but then you know bits like this are, are what bring that rating up yeah 
Yeah. Dave, honestly, I genuinely, I know I've picked a few, but I'm genuinely enjoying this. And I think as, as the battle with him and Savannah comes, because Savannah gets better of him and Billy has to turn into just as I'm done because he's absolutely petrified and Savannah doesn't understand what's going on, where the heck he's gone. And he then looks on the camera and sees Freddie and Freddie's shouting, which I, I must admit, I found a bit weird. Freddie's shouting as if he can't see Savannah, what Savannah's done, about four yards away from him going, Billy, yeah. Billy. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, you know what I mean? Like, and, and, you know, Savannah then looks on the telly and sees Freddie giving Shazam a dressing down and then puts, you know, two and two together and gets about 18. But he's, he's maths equations. Right. But I just felt that was a bit poor because I'm thinking, you're right in front of him. Why would you? <laughs> you've got a crutch. You can't run or anything. Why would you be stood right in front of the bad guy you've just seen flying around after shouting Billy's name? It was uh, on the convenience ometer. It was off the scale, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was the way Freddie wasn't even looking at Savannah as if he wasn't there. He was like looking through him on as it, it just yeah, it yeah. wasn't believable at all, Dave. It was. It wasn't exactly General Zod taking Lois or anything, was it? <laughs> I, I think you've got rose tinted glasses, honestly, with Superman too, mate. It's just <laughs> you, you, <laughs> hypercritical on other things. There's some <laughs> huge things wrong with that movie, but they I, don't, I think don't this is Superman. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd say as well, you know, if you go back to Big, you know, the fact that he just happens to play a bit of the piano with the store owner, and the store owner just decides to give him a job. You know, it's it's a movie, isn't it? It's a feel good movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I know, I know. And, and I must admit, Dave, I had a massive crush on the the woman in Big. But when you look back now, it's, it, obviously he was an adult and he ends up with her. But it was just all kinds of wrong, really. I suppose there was a lot of wrong. Can you imagine the other way around? The, the out, exactly. outrage that there'd yeah, be exactly. there. Exactly. As a kid, I was like, "Go on, son." But as, 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 <laughs> that's what you're thinking. Now it's not right. You know, it's but, even worse than Weird Science, isn't it? You know, Kelly yeah. LeBrock just gives the kid a, a bit of a snog. But uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, yeah you know, anyway. <laughs> I, I've got. Let me let me just go back to something, Dave. I've got to say, I think you're probably right. It is rose tinted glasses because Superman is one of my favourite heroes. So I accept that criticism. I do, and I'm. I genuinely, when I go down this route, I listen back, thinking, "God, you were so critical." So I don't mean it. anyone listening. Please, it's just my opinion. You know, watch it, ask Dave afterwards. The, the, the positive response to this film is probably. I've literally seen maybe forty positive responses on the big threads on Facebook for the Odeon and uh, Marvel and, uh, the, and Marvel, the DC sites, and maybe one. And that one person sounds like me, you know, like just picking little <laughs> holes in it. And I'm thinking, <laughs> for some reason, I've ended up in the minority with this one. And I usually just forgive anything on these superhero films. But but I, like I say, I am enjoying it. It's a good film. It is a good film. It's just, I felt at times I was watching a kid's film, I must admit, and I don't know if that's a good thing, bad thing. I said it to you last night when we texted each other after we'd watched it. And I, I genuinely felt at times that I shouldn't have been sat there watching it. I don't know why. It's strange. Right. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it was pretty much a kid's film. And like I say, it was only those few bits with the violence and what have you that brought it up. I had a little bit of swearing as well, brought it up to a PG-13. But that's kind of why I liked it. Yeah. You know, I, I watched The Goonies last week. Again, lots of things wrong with that movie, but it was just a lot of great fun. Yeah. Actually, it was, I tell you what, it was a lot more innuendo than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I've never watched but, it all the way through, you know. Have you not? Oh, no. crikey. It's, it, it's, it's a good movie. I mean, a young Thanos there. Uh, Josh Brolin's in it, isn't he? So, yeah. But anyway, not not to go off on a tangent about Goonies. But again, you know, I'd like to say a lot of things wrong with that, but a huge amount of fun. But, I mean, I guess, the you know, at this bit, at, at the end of the second act, we've got uh, Savannah. He knows where Billy is. He's kidnapped Billy, and he's gone back to the foster home. So we'll get on to what happens next there. But I must admit, one thing that threw me a bit that I wasn't expecting was that, you know, his, his family step up, don't he? His foster family, and they actually trace down his mother, which yeah. from the start of the movie, we know he's been desperately trying to find her. And uh, he does manage to find her, but it's not the happy reunion that we maybe thought it, it was going to be. No, I was with you, Dave. I thought it was the old classic cliched line of 
she, he goes to find his mum. She says something about some guy called Travis, who's got one of the most trailer park trash names you've ever heard. And he sounds aggressive because he's shouting. You don't see him physically, but he's shouting at her, isn't he? And I thought, Shout out to anyone who's called Travis. We love you. We love you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you live in we don't think you're a trailer park trash. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chris, keep your mouth shut. But, but definitely... Um, no, but, but the way they portrayed him was like he was a wife beater or something, even off, off that dialogue. Yeah. And she was petrified of this guy, and she's saying it's not the right time. And then we get this flashback of, because obviously we see at the start when Billy gets um, lost and the police have got him and she never turns up, that she was only 17 and that she, it wasn't the right time. She, ha she had to leave him and she did see him with the police. And once she saw him with the police, she, she decided to do a runner. Now, I couldn't understand how they couldn't trace her, but anyway, she disappeared, changed the name, to have made it. So I was thinking of this big reunion, and then when she was a bit off of him, thinking he's going to come back as Shazam and beat this guy up and save his mum. But that wasn't the case at all. It was just a case of she didn't want him, which was really... Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was good, Dave. I thought it was different. I, I genuinely thought, oh, here we go. It's the same old format here. He's going to come back as Shazam and beat this guy up. And, and it wasn't like that at all. It was, it was just genuinely she just didn't want him, which is a bit sad, really. I just could not wrap my head around how you could be like that. But I can accept someone in a different time of their life. She said she was 17, wasn't she? And mm. so she, it wasn't as if he'd walked off and then straight away she's like, oh, brilliant. <laughs> I can go, yeah. go out clubbing now. She'd seen him with the police and then instantly in that moment had made the choice, actually, he can go and have a better life. So I can kind of get behind that a bit. Again, it, it, I just could never see myself doing that you know, yep. for, for my kids. But this is set in 2019, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's set in the modern day. There is no way they wouldn't. He knows his name. Yeah. You know, there is no way they wouldn't be able to trace the mother, track the mother down. Now, I, I was kind of thinking, you know, maybe if they did a bit of a Batman thing where they, they set it in, in this kind of timeless time you know but it kind of looks a bit 1930s with some more modern technology you know I, I thought well i could believe that you know in years gone by they wouldn't be able to trace her down but but i thought there's no way in this day and age you you wouldn't be able to track her no i agree i'm glad you said that because i was trying not to be too critical again Dave, but <laughs> genuinely, it was because i'm thinking she said she was 17, so she left Billy there. The kid looks about three, doesn't he, when she leaves him? You know, because he can speak at all four years old. So, it's, so mm -hmm. she's potentially supposed to be 27 when he knocks on the door. And she looks the same age as me and you. She looks like she's 40-odd, doesn't she? She's had a hard life, hasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she does not look 27. And I, I genuinely was thinking that, thinking, well... Even in 2009, we had Facebook, you know what I mean? We had a social media. We had we even had bloody MySpace back then, Dave, which was quite current then. But, but there was stuff there that, that you could do. The, the internet was not in its infancy. The internet was in full force even 10 years ago. So I totally agree with you. I, I, it didn't make any logical sense. And there's no way that there wouldn't have even been TV appeals or anything, would there? It just doesn't happen like that. Like you say, maybe in the 80s, you could get away with it. Even the 90s had been a push, but certainly in this day and age, there's no way. I t I'm so glad you brought that up. There's not a chance that continuity-wise that even worked the way she looked or anything. Yeah, and I guess it, it just, it's a little clue, isn't it? I, I can't remember who the writers are for this, but it's someone a bit older, isn't it, who's written this? Yes. You know, yeah. with, with that in mind, if you had someone, you know, if you had a millennial writing this, it wouldn't even enter their head. That yeah. you couldn't find the kid. Yeah, so Dave, as you were saying that, I've just had a double check. William Goldman was the one who wrote this uh, movie, and he was 87 and died in November. So I hope you feel really, really bad about that, mate. Yep, yep, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put me forward before, Dave. So that, is a, that is a spectacular will from the in-betweeners launching my big <laughs> size nines into that one isn't it so yes yeah. it was old it was an older person uh so old that he's actually passed away brilliant day brilliant <laughs> well, all right. i've offended <laughs> everyone called travis so don't worry yeah. <laughs> god i do feel really bad now but but I, I, like i say again it from that little bit of the script it, it was obvious and, and you just wouldn't if they'd set it back in the thir in the late 30s or the 40s or something like that then yeah that could have worked and i guess they had to 
they had to kick our hero down, didn't they? They had to give him a little bit of a side quest. You know, he's trying to find his his mom, and actually, you know, he, he's just completely had the rug taken from out of him because you know you could have just wrote it that he was given up as a kid, you know, and he was trying to find his mom. You didn't have to do this whole lost in the fair in the Christmas fair kind of scene. <laughs> Yeah, because you are right. I mean, it made more sense for just to drop like we've seen in films. It's it's raining, it's dark, it's late at night. There's a knock on the door. There's a baby in a little cot, you know, mostly yeah. basket with a little note saying, <laughs> "Look after him." That would have been not, not, not really that it's cool. been done. We would have criticised it for being yeah, done a hundred times before, though, wouldn't we? But Dave, you, you that is actually a believable thing isn't it this is just like you know he's three years old and she just decides to just get rid of him i was like yeah come on yeah. you know what i mean so i mean don't forget that means she would have been 14 as well when she had him so it, it oh, she, she said she was 17 didn't she i thought she said she was 17 when she got rid of him she's 17 when she had him yeah but i don't think i don't think pregnancies go for three years no no <laughs> no I, oh right 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 yeah, no I, so she was 17 when he disappeared, I see what you mean now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, again, there's these all sorts of questions going on there. But anyway. That's, that's let's, a bit wrong, isn't it? Yeah, let's just move on, Dave, because we'll end up <laughs> completely offending everyone, I think, in this episode. <laughs> okay, let's, let's get on to it then. So, faced with Savannah and the seven deadly sins in the wizard's lair, the situation looked pretty bleak for our hero. But his foster family come to his aid and manage to distract him with a batarang. Billy and his family escape to the Christmas fair and the deadly sins are running riot. Faced with giving up his powers again, Billy has an idea for his family to touch the wizard's staff and say his name, transforming them into a family of superheroes to take on the baddies. Now, what do you make to this? This our final act, Chris. I quite enjoyed it, Dave. I quite like the fact that Freddy finally got to be a superhero because obviously he was he was the fan all along. And I did like the fact that the young girl, the sister, she actually, even though she became a superhero, she, she was still asking questions when she saw Father Christmas. And the, this <laughs> bit, <laughs> the, the, through the film, there's a running theme with Father Christmas. When Savannah destroys Shazam in the, the shopping mall after he's saved the bus, so, uh, Superman, Father Christmas, he's, he's sort of talking to a girl and, he about, and then says, you know, we'll just all stick together. And the next minute he's like, <laughs> run! And you get this thing all the way through where, where Father Christmas is just completely in the wrong place at the wrong time, isn't he? And she goes over to Father Christmas saying, I've been a good girl. And he's like, what? Hey, this is just, you know, but, but I so, do... So sorry, Chris. Again, just to be a little bit, um, to do our role reversals here. It's April. Yeah. This is clearly a Christmas movie. Yep. And I think you would have got just that extra couple of percent, maybe, of enjoyment out of it if this was released about November, December time. Yes. Why is it? Why are they releasing a Christmas movie in April? I must admit, I did think that because obviously his foster parents are putting a, a tree up, aren't they, at the start? And Billy yep. changes just his arm and knocks him out of his hand. Now, I know one of the biggest scandals or biggest talking points every single year is the fact that Die Hard come out in July. So and that is a Christmas film in my eyes. It always will be yeah. Christmas. It always will be Christmas for me, Dave. I don't know. I, I, even January, you might have got away with it. it. It must be a scheduling thing, Dave. It must be. I mean, for DC, surely the nearer to Christmas, the better when you're out in the same month as the Avengers. You know, I know it's made a lot of money already, but it's not going to make that money once the end of April comes in. It's yeah, I just thought it was strange. You know, everything about it was Christmas, wasn't it? So when Billy first went missing, it, that was at the Christmas fair. At the end here, they're in the Christmas fair. You know, like you say, the the foster family, they're putting up the, the tree when, uh, when the lights go out, you know, or the electricity goes when he changes back to Billy from being Shazam. I, I just thought, why is it coming out now? And And it just seems, you know, from those early drafts of the script, it would have been clear, I'm pretty sure, that it's that it's Christmas. So yeah, yeah, maybe that's why they didn't make a deal of it in the the trailers because they just could not release it around that schedule, Dave. Because surely they would have made more of a big thing of it. You are correct, completely right. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, there's me nitpicking a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's right. It's good. It's a good uh, question to ask because I I thought the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think these the old seven deadly sins. You know, we typically we're only seeing six of them, aren't we? 
I thought at times they looked really good on screen, but there were other times when they looked quite two dimensional. Yes, yes, I agree. Very, I mentioned Ghostbusters earlier, but it almost felt like that demon in Ghostbusters in the first one when it's chasing after Peter Venkman and stuff, and it looks like a bit like the Star Wars when they're playing the chess in the Millennium Falcon. That's Mm -hmm. that sort of CGI. Some of it was a bit off. I agree with that. I, I think that's a very good point, and I think as well. What's interesting is, I don't know whether you've, you know this, Dave, if you've ever read these comics, is what happens when he transforms the family, when they all gain the staff? Because he gets a bit of a beating, doesn't he? And they realise, because they throw the batarang at Savannah, that when he's not got the sins inside his body, he's weak because there's blood there. And Shazam sees that in the layer, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. And um, realises that he needs them out of him because he's not weak. Otherwise, he won't be able to defeat him. Now, is this something that happens in the Shazam world, where the whole family turn into superheroes? Is this just so, purely something for the film? These are all characters from the comics, so it, it doesn't happen in the same way. But there is a lot. Oh, there is a lot. Terrible English. There are a lot of characters that spun off Captain Marvel. Right. Okay. So, so these are all genuine characters, you know, and and so um, I I wasn't I must admit I wasn't expecting to see them in this movie, but you know when they popped up, it's like oh right, well blimey, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's not talk about all the wrongness with uh, touch this and say my name. <laughs> 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 Both from the uh, creepy old wizard to to when Billy, I, I did like that moment actually where he's, he's like, "Say my name," and they're like, "Billy, Billy, yeah, <laughs> no, yeah." Oh no, my it. other name. <laughs> Dave, Dave again, that got the whole cinema laughing. The whole cinema was laughing at that when he said Billy. I, I, yeah. <laughs> and, and there was a few bits in the film where me and Sam were actually laughing, and no one else was. You know, some of the wisecracks, and even even Sam got some of the subtle nods towards like the DC world. You know, some of the characters and that. Uh-huh. She's not a big fan like we are. She just has to <laughs> look. Fortunately, she has to sit with me watching them, but uh, more out of, <laughs> out of love for me than it is for the films. I hope. But but yeah, genuinely, she did get some of the nods and, and the little winks and some of the. Innuendo, uh, innuendo, innuendo, innuendo jokes as well, which were quite good. So, yeah, there is some good stuff in there. There really is. I think the battle with Billy and Savannah is good. But, again, I, I must admit, I got a bit bored of Billy constantly having to sort of get up his courage like he was the lion out of the Wizard of Oz. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know mm-hmm. exactly what you said, actually, is a great point about how he's – Normal personality as a 14 year old kid had more balls about him than Shazam. And you know, yeah, yeah. I think it would be the other way around completely. And I did get a little bored of him having to constantly try and find a bit of courage to beat him. Towards the end, I was like, oh, come on, just get your mad up or something. Like, that's an old school saying that day, but get your mad up, <laughs> do something. But you know, do do something. And then, and then the battle was good. The, the CGI was good. It was, it was, it was there. The battle with the seven uh, sins was good. Them two lads who'd obviously bullied Freddy were in the, the big wheel, which again, that was purely for the film because why they'd be in the big wheel, I do not know together. But, <laughs> <Yeah>. but, um, <laughs> like a little couple or something, you know, yeah, yeah. And they were 16 year old kids. On, yeah. They were spitting on He's like, Oh, I've just spat on a baby. And it's like, Oh, come on. But anyway, but, but- but they didn't get their comeuppance, did they? Because oh. when, when they had that bit, and it was like, oh, I spat, spat on a baby, it's like, all oh, right, you're 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 going to get it in some way. And even though the wheel was, you know, looked like it was going to collapse, I was thinking, well, you're going to get some kind of comeuppance with them. You know, I don't think they're going to be killed, but, you know, in that kind of 80s way, the school bullies will, will uh, you know, end up in some sort of embarrassing situation or, or come a cropper. But, that was the last I think you saw of them. No, you you see them at the end, don't you, in the school when it. But but did oh you, uh, uh, yeah, but not at the fairground. I mean, no, no. But did you? You literally did you get the blink and miss it line from the older Freddy, the, the superhero Freddy? No, you know, you know when he rescues him and he rescues them off because the, the actual one of the seven sins he's knock, knocks over the big wheel, yeah. the Ferris wheel, and as it's falling, Freddy, who's fighting one of the other sins. He sees them and he flashes across on it. And as he picks them both up, he went, oh, sorry about the wedges. But you literally mi- blink and miss it, Dave. You literally, uh... 
you wouldn't have, Dave, I swear to you, I literally just picked it up because I think it was the laughing bit then. People, uh, I picked up on it like that and it's literally blinking and miss it. But it's not even like a funny thing. He just sort of says it very quickly and then shoots off with him whenever he takes so, it. So you rescued him with a super, wedgie. super speed wedgie. Right. Yeah. Okay. So okay. It wasn't, it wasn't obvious. It, it lacked a bit of the, there should have been a joke there because of the way they treated him through the film. Exactly what you just said. They should have got the comeuppance. Yeah, I guess I guess they did, but I mean, I I didn't uh, I I didn't pick up on that. I, I must have been a like you say, blinking, you miss it. I must have been blinking at that time. Yeah, yeah. Sam didn't. I asked Sam if she did it. She didn't get it either. So it, it, it was literally. I'm not saying I was being clever. I literally you just hear it as the action's going on. Yeah, no, no. Good catch, good catch. But yeah, I thought what what was interesting. Uh, I thought was um, when Shazam had turned back into Billy. You know, and and Savannah's essentially drowning him there. Is he saying Shazam underwater? And you can hear it clearly, Shazam. Mm. Yeah, I I couldn't quite work it out why he didn't turn into Shazam there. So obviously he can't do it underwater. But we'd we've seen, and and we might do a bonus episode maybe on this one. But we'd seen, you know, in this last week, an animated feature, hadn't we? Yeah, where he he says Shazam underwater. And then he changes into Shazam. So, you yeah. know, I thought, I thought, what's going on there? I thought the same thing because if in the cartoon it's a bubble of air goes above the water, then it, as it pops, it says Shazam, done it, and saves him. And I actually thought they're not going to do that, are they? In this, how is that logically or scientifically possible? You know, physics, physics, and that. But it didn't. And you are right. It, it, I thought it was the cartoon bit, Dave. I genuinely yeah. did the animated bit because <laughs> <laughs> you sent it to me this week and we watched it. And I was like, Dave Horrocks, you've ruined the film now at, the, at this end bit. But you know, like laughing to myself. And he didn't do it, so I was like, oh, well, fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, very good, very good. And and I've got to say, Dave, the defeat Savannah. And obviously the, the family are all there and all this. And we go back to Billy is with his family and he puts his hand in finally, doesn't he, for the Thanksgiving or the the, yeah. the, the, the the meal. Every night they put the hands in and all the way through the film, as you mentioned before, there's a theme of Billy never feels accepted and he decides to put his hand in and sort of say his grace for everyone. And they all uh, enjoy it and stuff. And, and they're all a big family. And he's like, I'm with my family, which is great. Nice little touch. But then I've got to be honest, Dave, the best bit of the whole film for me is this last scene, and I know you, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> I do, <laughs> absolute, I do. <laughs> absolute. And that's, th- this is, though, what I said to you when, when we've talked about it before, about absolute Muppets online ruining the films and ruining scenes. We've said loads of times about the Han Solo bit in Force Awakens recently. This picture, I saw that picture last week, Dave, and I was like, oh, you absolute bar steward. And it wasn't an intentional look. It was just somebody retweeted it on our timeline. And Freddie's in having his dinner. He goes to sit on the table. All the kids are around him, aren't they? And some of the kids get up and walk off, sorry. And Freddie sat there and they're all like, yeah, whatever. You know, he's lied. He isn't friends with Shazam. And then obviously the foster kids, his brothers and sisters all sit around him, don't they? And you can see there's a chair free. So I'm thinking, well, he's obviously going to come in. And then he comes in, doesn't he, Shazam? Like, yeah, Freddie, I've learned everything. And all the kids are like going mad, aren't they, filming and everything. So he redeems Freddie as he wasn't lying. He is friends with Shazam. But then Dave... It happens, and we get a little <laughs> bit of it, and he goes, I've brought somebody else. Shazam says, I've brought one of my friends. And there walks in his the old Superman suit, but it's obviously not Henry Cavill. But that, for me, Dave, was I was just absolutely melting, going, yeah! <laughs> I, I know it didn't mean anything, but it was absolutely brilliant. I was like, oh, I love that. But like I say, some Muppet had ruined that for me earlier in the week. And I said to you, I wasn't going to say, I wasn't going to ruin it for you, but... I sort of knew. It was, I thought it was in one of the end credits. I didn't realise it was actually just before the film finished. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you don't have much luck with being spoiled with these uh, no. with these things. So it was a complete surprise for me. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Dave. The suit wasn't exactly Henry Cavill level suit, was it? It looked very plastic, but I was happy because it was Superman. Yeah, and you got a little bit of the music as well, didn't you? Yeah, so yeah. I, I yeah. thought that was great. I mean, it, it was. It was done for, you know, again, it's that kind of wish fulfillment. 
moments, isn't it? You know, the fact that not only is Shazam turned up, who you know he's the Philadelphia superhero, but you get the superhero Superman turning up at school to say hello as well, and it's like, oh, you know, imagine that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I was completely taken aback. But I did think to our conversations before, you know, about Henry Cavill and whether he'd actually make a, an appearance here. The fact that, you know, you couldn't see his head. I was like, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> they they clearly have fallen out then. Yeah, he's not going to be in anything in the future, I don't think, Dave, anyway, unfortunately. But yeah, and, and, and credits wise, Dave, well, I didn't know anything about this first end credit at all. I, I genuinely, I had to message you and ask what was going on because we, we get like a prison cell and uh, Sivian's in there and he's, he's writing, uh, so that's Sivian, Savannah's writing on the walls the seven sins in the code that gets you into the layer, Shazam's layer, the wizard's layer. Yeah. And it's all over the wall and there's only a little bit blank that's left. And as he, he's writing it again and he's saying it, the pencil breaks and then he starts hearing a voice and I'm thinking, who's this voice, you know? And then we look round and there's what can only be described as a caterpillar, a, a well, a pre, <laughs> a pre, um, butterfly caterpillar talking to him. And I'm thinking, what the heck is that? So it's the first thing I did was message you like, you know, it's like, what? And then you, if you could tell everyone what it is, Dave, because I genuinely didn't know what it was. Yeah, so so this is a, a character called Mr. Mind. He's an alien. He he is one of Shazam's supervillains. Uh, he, he first appeared around 1943. and uh, But to be honest, a lot of Shazam, it's very much golden age, you know, so it is a little bit silly. It's a little bit wacky and out there. Um, a, another one, another little nod, so you didn't get it, but there's a character called Talky Tawny, and he's basically, when he first appears, he's basically like a tiger, but he stands upright and walks around and can talk. And there were a few points in the movie where there was a little nod, you know, a little tiger, a little cuddly tiger who would appear at the fair and stuff. You know, again, you just had these silly concepts in, you know, Captain Marvel as it was then. And so, yeah, you get this Mr. Mind character. Uh, so it's very much looking ahead towards a, a sequel this one and um yeah I, I must admit though you know be, being influenced with more recent things uh i was more thinking plankton from spongebob <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know if I, wrote, I could even buy that as a as a baddie but well i'll have to, I'd, look, I'd be so intrigued if, if he's the center of a a sequel dave i really would and i've read up the panel you sent me for his character he's the leader of a group of proper like meta humans in a, like these these monsters these, these proper matches for shazam or a superman type character so yeah he's the leader bait he's a bit like um kang off uh, teenage mutant ninja turtles he's a brain that controls everything but he's not very good himself at fighting people and that so i, th I think that's what we're getting at and and do I buy it? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Especially when you've got someone like Thanos, who's absolutely ridiculous on the Marvel side. And you've got a little, I don't know, a little maggot there. Whatever it is. <laughs> it's a bit, of a, a bit of a contrast. But again, it may work. It may not, Dave. I don't know. And obviously uh, I love this. Right? I love it because it is so wacky. It is so golden age. And it's, the like you say, this group, the Monster Society of Evil, you know, and potentially in a sequel, he's going to team up with Savannah. I just think it's so out there. Well done to New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers for, for taking a chance on something like this. No, fair enough, Dave. I'm going to keep my gob shut. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think to be fair, the second one, the second end credit was very much on the line of the ant playing the drums in Ant Man and Wasp because yeah, it's yeah. just a throwaway. He's pretending to he, at the end of the whole credit. So bear in mind, the first middle credits is about yeah, it's about a minute into the credit. The second one's a good five or six minutes. And it's at the end when all of, everything's rolled and it's just basically Shazam and Fred and he's pretending to talk to a fish in it and saying, like, you know, I, I can't. And Freddy tick circles it just to say he can't telepathically talk to a fish and all this. It's just a little joke in it more than anything. But you, if, you don't, if you don't want to see that, I'm sure you can see it on YouTube. But the middle one is important, to be fair. But, um, but yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I do like the second one as well, though. I think it's a bit better than the ant playing the drums because... It is just poking fun at Aquaman, isn't it? 
Yes, because he's got yeah. the shirt on, hasn't he? Yeah, so, you know, he's he's uh, they're still testing out the range of his powers because, you know, Shazam has got all the powers because you've got, you've got magic in there. You know, it's not like Superman where he's kind of still constrained by the laws of physics, you know, uh, apart from the whole uh, memory loss, you know, uh, not insomnia. What is it when you, you lose your um, memory? <laughs> it's the irony of this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My, uh, amnesia, well, it, amnesia. Amnesia, yeah, the whole amnesia <laughs> kiss, you know. <laughs> You're so right, Dave. What a pain. The, um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it, uh, that, and that's the old, they do some ridiculous things at, at times, you know, and, and that, that I think that was from the comics back in the day. But Shazam is very much, you know, his origin is, has got the magic. So, you know, it would make sense that they're continuing to see, okay, what can he actually do? So so the fact that they tried it and, you know, they're saying, well, that would be useless, wouldn't it? You know, <laughs> if you could actually talk to fish, I just thought it was a brilliant little, a little poke of fun at, at the Aquaman character. Yeah, no, no, good. And, and again, because we've had the Batarang, we've not seen anything to do with Batman other than a couple of daft toys and that, as I mentioned before. We've seen a Superman figure in the film, and we've also alluded to Aquaman as well. So there's a potential for a full DC team up again, isn't there, Dave? Another offshoot of Justice League, I suppose. Or yeah. Shazam turning up in any of their films. So it's all set within that world. Would I be upset with that? Not at all. Not at all. I just yeah. hope... Sorry. It's funny, it's funny, isn't it? Because we've said, okay, so Warner Brothers are going to focus on more of these individual movies, these individual stories. But with just that last couple of seconds where Superman shows up, you kind of think, well, now it'd be slightly ridiculous if they didn't team up in a future movie. Yep. It's weird how that goes, isn't it? We, we've openly agreed maybe DC needs to go down a different route because of the, like, the, lukewarm reception of Justice League and Batman v Superman. So, yeah, mad, mad. Maybe it's just going to be a whole change, a different Superman, Dave, I don't know. Yeah, I think it will be a different Superman. But I thought for at least, you know, the next kind of five years, you'd have these individual stories, we'd have a few sequels, um, and then they'll see how it goes. And then, okay, we might team up with whatever array of characters we've got then. But like I say, it, you're almost, it's a, it's a little fun end scene. They're just turning up at a local high school at lunchtime, you know, but then you'd start to question if you saw Shazam and he was in peril now in the in the sequel, you'd start to think, well, why doesn't he just give Superman a call? Yeah, 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 come and help him. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a bit like what I mentioned on the Aquaman review, wasn't it? How it was a bit weird. Superman was nowhere to be seen when the world was sort of being decimated. But Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no good stuff, Dave. So do you want to go into the review, Dave? Let's go for it. So, Dave, I do believe it's you this week, mate. I do believe you're right, I think. We've <laughs> recorded a little bit out of order, haven't we? So, no, on the last one, which will be the next episode. <laughs> got it wrong, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I don't know. I'll go ahead and, and, uh, yeah. uh, and do it. So, again, I mentioned this before. It is really hard to talk about Shazam formerly known as Captain Marvel, uh, without mentioning that term, wish fulfillment. And for me, we saw it from the trailers, and, and the, the movie did absolutely reflect what we were seeing on the trailers, apart from the fact it's all set at Christmas. I thought this absolutely nailed it. I thought they nailed getting that first action scene in, you know, in the first couple of minutes in the movie, you know, having something big and significant happening, you know, rather than lots of dialogue and slow plodding along. I, I thought they did that really well. I thought the overriding emotion is absolutely one of joy. It was just a fun movie. Uh, there were a few moments of violence and whatever, a few little darker moments with the seven deadly sins, but you know, that, that just gives a nice contrast to that joy. I also thought there was a lot of heart, a lot of emotion to the movie as well. All the things that you want from, let's say, a, a younger aged or a younger feel of a movie. You know, this is far, far away from the likes of Man of Steel or Batman versus Superman or Justice League. You know, this is just a classic golden age character brought to life on the screen, brought into the modern day. 
And you can't help but think yourself, what a great thing it would be to be Billy Batson, you know, with all these powers and whatever, you know, go order yourself some beer, even if you don't like the taste of it. I I just thought this, for me, was probably DC's best movie to date. I enjoyed Aquaman. I thought, again, there were moments of fun in that. But I thought there was there was quite a lot wrong with the movie as well. But I liked it because it was a change of direction, clearly, from Warner Brothers and DC, whereas they absolutely nailed this. Definite callbacks to other 80s movies, especially big, you know, and I didn't think there were going to be such blatant nods like the, the whole piano bit. But I, again, for me, just perfectly executed. And I hope to see, I, I am chomping at the bit to see a sequel for this. I want to see more Zachary Levi playing Shazam. Uh, I want to see a bit more of the Marvel family as well. Uh, I'd like to see them back in the same kid characters because I think they all nailed it as well. I thought Mark Strong was a good villain. You know, he's a great actor anyway, but, you know, we always say that a good villain makes the story as well. Uh, quite like that. So for me, this is absolutely an Asgard. This is obviously an origin movie, so Amex, it's not quite as strong an Asgard as, say, something like Avengers Infinity War or what I expect Endgame to be. But in terms of comparing it to other origin stories, other first movies, I think this is right up there. Good stuff. Good stuff, mate. So, I've been thinking about this all night, Dave, about the review, what I was going to do, what I'm going to score it as. I, I honestly think that Zachary Levy, or Levi, is great, fantastic. The lad who plays the young Billy's good Freddy, standout characters within the film. I think their dialogue, the sort of comedy timing, the duo, that dynamic duo as such together, it really works. It's really, really good, really good. Mark Strong's good as the baddie. I don't think you have to worry about him being evil or sinister. You buy it from the start that he's just not a nice guy and he can be easily turned. As I said at the top, 15 minutes or so, I just wasn't into it at all at the start. I felt like it was just a bit thin, a bit weak, the story. I know that's the story of Shazam and how he becomes Shazam, but I wasn't completely invested. Now, for actual laughs, I've got to say, it, it's probably one of the funniest superhero films I've seen. For, for actual, there's a couple of proper belly laughs in this one, not just ones where you're laughing because you know it's an in-joke and, and you, you have to know the origin of the films or the characters. There is some genuinely funny bits in it. Again, like you said, Dave, some 80s throwback stuff's really good, really good. However, I do feel that like I was watching a kid's film and, and at times the tone away from Man of Steel, from Batman of Steel, Justice League, is the right call. I just felt that it got overplayed and overplayed within this film at times. So for me, please don't be discouraged by it. I am being a bit of a negative Annie on this one. I do apologise, but I'm saying that it's a hall of justice. I actually think that having watched this, I need to go back and watch Captain Marvel, as in Brie Larson, Captain Marvel, because I think I've underscored that because I actually come out of this enjoying that Captain Marvel more than this one. So uh, yeah, interesting Dave, but he's got to be middle of the road for me, unfortunately. Wow. <laughs> I am blown away by that. So let's think, you know, our traditional leanings. I kind of lean a little bit more, you know, quite openly. I, I try and challenge myself on that, but I, I do appreciate the Marvel properties a bit more than DC. You are absolutely over on the DC side as well. On the other way, I know, you know, you obviously love the Marvel movies as well, but just your favorite characters and properties are definitely on the DC side. And it's me championing the DC. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, this is all right. <laughs> and uh, probably Brie Larson's Captain Marvel is a bit better. So I, I was not expecting that, but absolutely, you know, again, that's what we're here for, isn't it? You know, yeah. we look at things from in different ways and challenge them and, and give our opinions on it. So, so yeah. And I think it's negative Nancy, not, not negative Annie. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of I couldn't think of the name. <laughs> I think that's her sister. Yeah, it could be, yeah, yeah. That's a twin sister, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Maybe ang uh, angsty Annie or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I can only apologise, everyone out there. It's just how I felt. And I didn't go into it feeling tired or anything. We're at a perfect time. So it's not like I've gone late at night. So if I've gone to a midnight show into some of these films, I have come out of stuff feeling quite negative about, mainly because you're tired. So it was a perfect afternoon matinee showing of this. And, and 
it's a shame. I will watch it again, Dave. I've got to say, I, I said to you about Solo, I watched that and really hammered that, and we both did. But when I watched it the second time, I actually quite enjoyed it. So I don't dislike it, but I, I'll be interested as well because Hellboy's out as well, which is a completely different film that we're going to review in the next week or so. And I'd be interested to see what I think of that because that looked absolutely awful on the first trailer. But the second trailer has really brought me in. And I'm not one for scary, dark films as such. Not like that anyway. That's got a horror element to it. But I've got a feeling I might enjoy that more than this. So I'll, I'll see. And that's just me speaking out loud. I haven't watched anything of it. So <laughs> it could be the worst thing I've ever seen. But, but we'll see. Yeah, I'm I'm going to speak out loud as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, <every> time. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I don't think you're going to get any horror from Hellboy. I, I think it's, it's obviously a bit darker, but, you know, it's not, uh, it's not Halloween horror or anything like that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I, I'm wondering as well that, you know, when you're first introduced to a concept – or, or something you know it's it's a little bit foreign and and you you might like it the thing you like listening to an album for the first time yeah you don't absolutely love it on the first listen through you know and it, and i'm not and i'm even classing you know some albums are like a growers aren't they yeah again showing my age here, i don't think anyone buys albums anymore more buy singles don't they but yeah um you know I, I, because you're not really aware of Billy Batson and, and that original Shazam and what he's all about. You know, a lot of these concepts are new, you know, and, and especially the, the most ridiculous it being that first end credit scene with Mr. Mind. I wonder if that's hampered your enjoyment a bit. And the fact that it is, you know, in a lot of the movie, quite kiddish, you know, it's, yeah. it's definitely playing on this wish fulfillment of being that young boy, you know, transforming into this adult superhero. Yeah, I, I think, I, again, I'd say, you know, to listeners, I, I doubt you've listened to this and not watched it. But if you are on the fence, I, I would absolutely go and watch it. But it definitely is. It's going to speak to you more if you're expecting a kid's movie rather than if you're comparing it against some of the other comic book movies that we've watched and reviewed and, and have been out over the last few years, they are a bit more grounded. I, I don't want to say real world because none of it's real world, but, you know, just a bit more realistic. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I I, I think that's a fair point, fair point. And I, I've said it before, and I will come back on the the episodes of the podcast further down the line. And if I do watch it again and say, yeah, I was wrong, I will call myself out. I've done that before, haven't I? So... Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, good shout, Dave. So before we go, I just want to thank everyone as always for listening. If you want to get in contact with the show on Twitter at Comics in Motion P, on Facebook, Comics in Motion Podcast, and we're available on all podcast hosting sites. And if you want to email myself or Dave or call me out for giving it this score, then please email us on Comics in Motion Podcast at gmail.com. And that's it, Dave. Now, Dave. You loved it. It's only fair that you should lead us out today. Well, I, I do have to wonder, you know, how does Billy introduce himself when he's in the Hall of Justice and, you know, everyone's introducing themselves? How does he actually introduce himself if he can't say his own name? You know, you had this whole history of, you know, originally it was Captain Marvel and he said these words, but then his name changes to it. It's a bit inconvenient if you introduce yourself as Shazam and then you change and then you're going to have to say it again, you know, to change back. But then everyone knows your secret identity. But there's only one word that you can really finish this off with, isn't there? And that's to say, Shazam! Dude, just mess around. You look at me and you're like, why so dark? You're a disabled foster kid. You've got it all. You know why? So they can fly away from this conversation? No, because heroes fly. Hello? Say my name so my powers may flow through you. But I don't know your name, sir. Shazam. Are you for real? Say it's okay! Shazam? Drive up your window! Hey, but, hey, welcome for not getting robbed! Oh, hey, what's up? I'm a superhero.